welcome aboard. It's time for a little cruise with Dora the Boatress. Let's discover the world of boating as we navigate the waters together. And now, here's Dora. Dora Miles, the Boatress with Dockside Live 365. And um, I'm hoping I'm going to pronounce this right. I, I kind of have almost, it's starting to be a tradition where I mispronounce everyone I interview's names inappropriate or wrong. And so is it Gina DeVere? Correct. Yay. Yeah. Okay. Gina DeVere, you guys. And, and Gina is, um, she has authored a book uh, entitled Blue Water Women. Um, and I have read the book. This is an absolutely amazing book. Um, and Gina herself, um, she sails, she lives on a sailboat. Um, I've seen the pictures. Um, I've seen a few YouTube videos, absolutely amazing woman, um, who happens to have met 40 other women who sail, which is amazing to me that all together, um, and wrote a book about it. And so, um, I'm, I'm interviewing Gina today and, um, Gina, where are you at right now? What part of the world? I'm in West Papua which is a province of Indonesia, and it's the furthest east that you can go before you get to Papua New Guinea. Absolutely. And how long are you uh, there for? Oh, I think we've been here a couple of months already, and we've got another month to go exploring some more islands. It is absolute paradise here, especially if you're if you like diving or snorkeling and you love the sea and the sea life um, because it's unspoiled it's a, like a national park area there's something like um, it's part of what's called the coral triangle so there are about 70,000 let me just check the figure because I wouldn't like to tell you wrongly um, about yes 27,000 square miles worth of coastline um, and islands so it it is protected highly protected so that the coral grows and comes back where it has been denuded in the past because people were using dynamite uh, to get fishes in the past oh wow but, we had, yeah, we had to pay a um, hundred US each uh, for the privilege of being here, and it is a privilege. It is uh, hardly anybody, nobody is living around here at all, except the few odd huts you see that belong to dive centres. Uh, there's a lot of diving, and that's how they make their their living here. And there's one or two cities, if you can call them that. <laughs> Um, where you can get provisions so it is well, pretty some, remote some of the pictures that you send me I'll have to see if I can edit those into the video so people can see some of those pictures they were absolutely beautiful uh, you're what you're right privilege what a privilege to be able to be there and to be and to be spending time so uh, earlier you guys we were trying to get the audio figured out on the video and, and, and Gina took a cloth and, and, and dabbed her face to, to, to wipe some of the sweat off of her face and I as I sit here in what is getting ready to be a 26 degrees where I am at and I said Gina what is the temperature where you're at right now and she said what did you say 33s 33 yes I was like okay mm -hmm. Celsius so I did the math on 91.3 degrees where she's at right now so I'm, I'm a little envious not only of your view but your temperature of where you are at right now because it's very cold <laughs> where I am and we have storms rolling in and so uh, my co-host for my Ooh. other show that I do uh, the Boatress and the Beach Bum um, he's in Chicago so it's usually colder for Chicago Illinois yes. and so it's usually yeah, yeah. Um, colder for him than it is for me so I assure you he would be Johnny would be a little bit jealous right now too so um, oh, I just have to jump in the water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, I am not an ocean swimmer. So you'll probably find that to be a little bit shocking too. I always laugh with Johnny because he's a beach bum. I mean, he loves the ocean. I am a lake. I, I don't, I'm not a big saltwater person. I am a, I'm a, I'm a lake person. And I, he always laughs at me. I, and I tell him, I said, you know, when you're in, when you're in the lake water, those things might nibble on you a little bit, but when you're in the ocean, that shit will eat you. And I'm going, I, I do not <laughs> <laughs> I have no interest in that. You know, you'll see people on these on these catamarans and these sailboats and they'll get on this line and they'll swing out and then they'll launch themselves in the water. Yeah. And I think to myself, 
you are bait. You are you are a gigantic <laughs> bait slinging yourself out onto a line into the water. And then for, I know that our listeners, because we have such a huge, huge saltwater base listener base and I, they all roll their eyes at me laugh and go she's crazy you know but I and and then they all throw themselves in the salt water I think no you're the crazy one because <laughs> I'll take yeah. a nibble I don't want to lose a limb <laughs> so but for people <laughs> like you who are constantly on the salt water I guess you just get used to it and then you become fearless and then you just don't well no I hmm, as an interesting point fear? you brought up because it, it yeah you there has to be a healthy fear but um, we have seen, we have swum with manta rays. There are lots of them here. Um, there are dolphins we see in the bay where we are. There are sand sharks, um, small sharks. But uh, in fact, we're going to an island called um, Wyag where I'm going to swim with sharks. And uh, they are fed, I hope really well yeah. <laughs> before you get in the um, water preferably yeah, yeah 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 but that'll be an experience yes well so, so what inspired <clears throat> you to write this book I was back in New Zealand and I've only been back twice since 2005 and talking to my neighbor over the over the water Lynn Party and said to Lynn, you know, there isn't a, a book for women. And um, do you think that there's a, a space for that, a need for that? I'm thinking that she might do something. And she said, yeah, sure. She said, you write it and I'll help you publish it. So that's pretty much what happened. Um, How long so did you having, to write it? Uh, two years. Two years. Mostly because we're traveling all the time. I mean, we left New Zealand in 2005, and we've been on the move pretty much all the time since then, uh, around 35,000 nautical miles, which wow. is more than an around the world. Yeah. Um, in fact, yeah. So it's, it's um, I've got a, a husband who is a consummate sailor. I mean, frankly, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for him. But we share a love of the sea. We're both water signs. Um, and we, we love the sea, but he's known the sea since he was seven years old. So I was very fortunate because I didn't come to sailing until I was 58. Um, okay, so that you can work out the maths. That was 20 years ago, pretty much. Um, so uh, it's been an adventure right from the get-go. Christian, who, or just friend turned up in New Zealand and said, look, I have a dream to go sailing again. Are you interested? Well, you know, I had a, I had a good thriving business consultancy. I was well known in the, in the area in which we live. And I had a son and his mates and, you know, a good social circle. I had a lovely life. Did I really want to go with this man that I hadn't known for very long? Um, I wasn't too sure. Uh, but then, you know, Dora, I remembered I'd had a dream as a child. I was sitting in cold England because I was, even though I'm a Kiwi, I was schooled in England. You can probably tell by the voice. And um, I was sitting by the window in the school. I always got the window, looking out, and the River Thames was not far away. And I'd be dreaming of going down the river and crossing the channel and going into the Mediterranean to somewhere warm. And, and I realized that that's really what I wanted to do. And that dream came back to me. And so, yes, it was a dream come true for both of us. So we both worked very, very hard, several jobs. It took us a couple of years more than we thought, but we got it all together. And then, oh, but we've been married for 20 years or, so, or more, 25, I think. Yeah. And 25. Yeah. Yeah, we spend every day pretty much together. Mm. It, you know, that works so, for some. That's, kind of... that, that's <laughs> impressive. For, did you say 25 or 27 years? Probably 27. 
27 years. You guys have been sailing and living in, in your sailboat for 27 years. 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. So that we, that's we finally. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. That's pretty impressive. Um, so you have, you interviewed 40 different women. How did you find 40 different women for this book? Well, we were in a place called Langkawi, which is uh, the northernmost part of Malaysia, uh, only 20 nautical miles or so from the southernmost part of Thailand, if you can imagine that. And then I went back to New Zealand, as I said, and came back with this idea. So I went around the, uh, the marina and I talked to the various women that I'd met there or those that I hadn't met and uh, talked to them about their backgrounds and, and so on. And I thought, yes, there, there's quite a few women from different countries, you know, from France, from Sweden, from Switzerland, uh, from the States, from Canada, and the UK, and New Zealand, and Australia. There's quite a lot of women here, but there was nowhere near 40 women. And then um, I decided that I would send out a, I think it was a seven point questionnaire, keeping it simple, about the things that probably I consider the most important when you go sailing. And when you want to know, when you want to know the best way of proceeding before you do that first ocean crossing because there's quite a lot to learn and to be aware of, I think, more than anything. And so I chatted to, to Lynn about it and said oh, how I was getting on. She said, but you know, if you're going to have a, a US editor and publisher, that you really, you need to have over 50% Americans. So at the time I had about 20 from all over the world. So I had to go out and find another, another 20 but you know it's amazing how things happen and the women that I had they said oh but have you heard of so and so did you know about so and so and that is how I got to meet some women that you probably know quite well and I have met them online and some of them um, I was asked to go and talk at the Vancouver boat show a couple of times and got to meet some of you wonderful uh, seagoing, cruising women, sailing women um, from the Northwest and from Port Townsend because of uh, Casey Cronkite. And you, you probably know some of the American women and the Canadian women that uh, are in the book. Um, Amanda Swan Neal who was running charters with her husband. Uh, she's sort of a hybrid between the USA and New Zealand. I think she's back in New Zealand at the moment. Um, Gwen Hamlin, a uh, very um, busy lady, and uh, she started womenoncruising.com. I have I spoken with her. I do. I have spoken oh, yeah. with her, yes. Oh, great. Yes, lovely person. Um, Holly Scott who uh, has uh, a company called Mahalo Sailing, and she runs charters um, all over the place. And um, she's very knowledgeable and a long-term sailor. Judy Hildebrand, and she's uh, interesting because Judy has no boat, but she gets around the world. She delivers boats for other people. And that's, uh, I think more and more women are doing this, becoming skippers getting their skipper's tickets. Yeah, her story was interesting. I enjoyed reading her together. story. All right. <laughs> um, Casey Cronkite, who is a, an avid wooden boat um, person with her beautiful boat, Pax, and she's a, a writer as well. Um, she comes from a farming or a horse background, I think, but she took to the sea and fell in love with it with an old boat. And she has a book called finding packs, um, which is about a beautiful old wooden boat and her story there. Colleen Wilson on um, 
Espy Moticia. She's in the Philippines. Actually, I think she is actually back in the States at the moment. Um, she hasn't been too well lately, but she's on the mend. And then there's Pat Mundus. And Pat was a real um, firebrand in her day. Being, she went to Fort Chula and in New York and came out as one of the, um, the, the first, um, I don't know, what do you call them when they come out um, with their decorations? And she was a deck officer on a huge oil tanker. And in those days, women just didn't have those kind of positions. No. Mm -mm. She tells she tells some wonderful stories about what it was like, and um, yeah, there's a very strong, courageous woman there, uh, Linda Morgenstern, and she is a, an excellent diver, and she's in the Philippines as well. Uh, Lisa McFay, I think she sold her her sailboat for the sea, and she and her husband are now sailing on a lake in Arizona. Um, Lynn Pardy, the doyen of, of sailing, who has written oh, well over 40 books and videos and DVDs and everything from the years that she and, and her husband, who's now deceased, um, wrote together. And uh, we're still in, in, you know, in touch, of course, and she's got a new book coming out soon. Um, so... Judy, oh, Holly, that's right. I wouldn't like to forget anybody. Um, and then, of course, in, in Canada, Beth Cooper um, on Sarah Jean 2. Um, Kathy Simon. Now, Kathy and Charlie, what a couple. They've just uh, reached Antarctica and um, on their boat, SB Celebrate. And they've done a passage through the north to Alaska a couple of times. Um, Mary Ann Unrau on Traverse 3. Now, Mary Ann was very kind to me when I was in um, Vancouver. And, you know, she showed me a photo of her boat just a couple of months before, and it was covered in snow and ice. And I think they were still living on board. She has her piano on board, a special room. A well, special I, room I, I piano. have a note here about. I have a note here when it talks about, um, let me find it. Hang on. It talks about, so chapter 20 is your boat buying experience. And it talks about um, space for piano. Uh, they literally <laughs> designed their boat to have space for a full size piano room on their boat. I mean, I, I get it. If that's, if that's your thing and that's, what's important to you, then you need to have the P I understand that. I, I totally get it. But I thought I would love to see pictures of, of that boat in real. I would love to experience <laughs> that in real life. That has got to be something else. Actually, I'll have to, I'll have to ask and see if she's got a photo. She must have a picture of it. And I can forward it to you. Yeah. But I think that when, when you're sailing, it's important to have things for the downtimes that you really enjoy. Um, Christian and I are avid readers. And when we started out, our whole, the hold was full of books. But now it's become more digitized because we don't have such a big hold right. in, in this boat. We have water tanks, 800 liters of water instead. Um, I believe that um, Lynn Pardy had a red wine bottle, she tells me. <laughs> so whatever turns you on, you know, you've got to have something to relax with to keep you interested. And I think the biggest thing that many women who've been in business and not grown up with the sea find that when they make that break to go sailing, they become a different person because they have to. And it's not a comfortable journey sometimes because you're living behind your status, you know, who you are and who mm -hmm. you think you are anyway. And I think Anne Cantrell in her book um, about change has a, a wonderful line in that, in that the sea brings you face to face with who you really are and uh, gives you the opportunity to become who you would like to be. 
Well, and, I was really impressed yeah. with about, um, so chapter four talks about you had, and I didn't write all the names down because I thought either you would know, or even just talking about some <laughs> of these, uh, chapter four about becoming your own captain. There was one woman in there and she spoke about, she went through a divorce and the first thing she did was bought her own boat. She oh, apparently, yes. yeah, she, she was, she, uh, captain, I guess, and first mate with her husband. Um, and when she that got divorce. Yeah. And when she got a divorce, she bought her own boat with her son and she just figured it out. She was like, just because I'm getting a divorce, this is not going to stop me. I'm going to buy my own boat and I'm going to continue to sail with my son. And I thought, man, and that's exactly that's what me. she did. And, and, you know, Anna is quite, it's quite an amazing woman. When we bumped into, you ask how, how I met people. We met each other the first day that we landed in Australia, we'd crossed the Pacific and she was waiting for her dog to come out of um, whatever, wherever they keep them um, in Australia until you're allowed to have your animal back. And uh, I remember it was my birthday and we had spaghetti on board our boat and got to know each other there. And when we got to Brisbane, I actually worked in HR with Anna um, for quite a while and we were on on the river the Brisbane River together so you form these bonds and um, she became she was a good sailor but she wasn't aware of it because her husband was very capable he could do everything himself so you know it's very difficult sometimes yep. to learn things you really have to know what you want to know or what you need to learn or to watch carefully the whole time anyway long story short she did buy her own boat and she was in Singapore by then still working for Microsoft and she was most unusual they thought there because she lived on her boat and put on her suit and worked um, in a high level position in Microsoft now she's still working for Microsoft I believe but in Portugal with her new husband. Good for her. So it's amazing. Yes, how, how these lives continue. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I was in, you know, the next chapter, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very intuitive. I watch people's behaviors around me all the time. Um, and I, and I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, I, I went through a, a rough marriage and I think that you, mm. when you, when you, sit back and you're you you become passive and quiet because you don't have a choice other than to sit back and be passive and quiet uh as a part of um survival more or less um you, you start to become very intuitive to everything that's going around you learning how to react to not make people angry and, and things like that so you just you you just become very intuitive to what's going on around you and so on chapter five in, in when I, when I built my campground, we, my husband and I had, had a, a larger home and we sold, you know, we, we sold our home. We, we came down here. We lived in a camper for a little while. We just recently moved back into a smaller home and we have no desire to ever have a large home again after living in a small camper. And if it wasn't for a teenage daughter, we probably would have remained in a small camper for the rest of our life, living together in a camper and, you know, 300 square feet did not bother us. We enjoy each other's company. We communicate very well. We treat each other with respect. We don't say rude things to one another. You know, we have rules that we abide by in our home where we don't raise our voices in our home and we don't speak disrespectful to one another. And so when you abide by those rules in your marriage and in your relationships, you don't have confrontations with one another that involve disrespect. Respect. And so that's how you are able to communicate with people in small spaces in confined spaces, and you're able to work through those things. And so uh, obviously our listeners are not aware of this, but before we started having this Zoom call to where we could do this, we were having some issues with um, Gina's uh, speaker not working. Her microphone was not working. And so I'm sitting here watching Gina attempting to figure out how to get her microphone to work. And you could tell she was starting to get a little frustrated and she was starting to give her husband a little bit of stink eye over the top of her computer and trying to figure this out. But you could tell there was a level of respect there of, you know, trying to figure this out in frustration, but keeping her cool in, in an attempt to do that. And I'm, I'm watching this go down through my computer screen and I'm going, this is really cool that they are able to live together in this confined space and continue to have respect for one another and, and live together this many years and work together and, and, and live this way. And so kudos to you guys. 
did you guys live that way? And I'm sure you have your moments. Everybody, you know, they have their moments where they just need to breathe. You stay down here. I'm going upstairs and we're going to breathe and we'll come back together and have this conversation later. I'm sure there's those moments. But when reading chapter five, talking about communication and learning how to deal with people, um, you know, that I think that was a very important chapter to have in this book and that everybody who lives in confined spaces like this, that's a, that's a major issue. People get sick of other people and you have to know how to deal with that. If you're going to live and you're going to sail with another, with, with a significant other or with anybody, your children, mm -hmm. your dog would get mm -hmm. on your nerves. That's right. That's right. Uh, it, it's a learning process. It's a learning process, but then Christian and I have both been in the communications business mm -hmm. um, uh, as a, as a life coach, as I still am. Um, and as a business coach uh, with my own consultancy. So we, we had that to build on and being naturally gentle people with a lot of fire as well. Yeah, because I mean, even good. as stressful as that was, you know, and you could probably tell me, I was like, hey, Gina, we got all night. Don't stress. We're good. This is no big deal. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. I mean, I've, gi I've given up expecting expectations that things are going to work first time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i want you to give up those expectations life's a lot easier isn't it absolutely um, you know as people say to me well here you are at uh 77 dare i say and what are you going to to do next well we're going to do more motorbiking we've already motorbiked um all the well christian more than i more than me but i i fly in and i join him for a few hundred Ks or whatever. Um, and we'll do more of that because I believe, or we both believe that you have to have future goals. Yeah. And so this, this trip for us is taking our lovely star dancer um, back up to Langkawi where we left last year. Um, and we will put her on the market and we will start a new life of adventure being based in Bali, I think. So you're you're going uh, to you're going to sell the sailboat? We will. And you're well, going to start motorbiking. That's the next well, we're doing more of it. Yes. Doing more of more it. Motorbikes in in Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam and uh, Thailand. Do you think you'll write another book about that? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I don't think I'll be asking forty people to contribute. I tell you, it was like chasing cats trying to get some of the answers back. Oh, I'm sure. It was absolutely worth it. And in the meantime, I think what's been wonderful for me is making those connections, those communications, those friendships, and seeing how how these women's paths have sometimes crossed and what's happening to them over, over the years. Um, there are some who have totally stopped and they decided that sailing wasn't for them. Now there's a couple who bought a boat online, I think it was $64,000 or something. Um, they had never stepped on a sailboat and uh, they, they came over, flew over, it was didn't even bother to get it um, checked out. It, the engine worked, yes, and so they set off. Intrepid couple, intelligent uh, couple, but my goodness, the problems they got into because they didn't have that grounding. You know, Dora, you do need to know the different um, signs to obey on the water, so yeah. to speak. Um, they got into problems in the most busy. Um, straits and waterway in, in the world with huge cargo ships around, around Singapore going into the wrong lane. Now that it could be a recipe for disaster. Yeah. They must, you know, they had problems with the sails, breaking sails, uh, an anchor, their anchor. Oh, you don't want to be near people like that when they, you're anchoring because their anchor dragged. Now, luckily it didn't bang into any rocks or into any other boats. But there is, there, you know, there are things that you need to learn. Now, learning these things, getting the certificates, doesn't necessarily make you a good sailor. No. It is the, the knowledge of the currents, the winds, uh, time of the year, and always being, 
always being alert, basically. Yes, I would say. So there's, there's more than just the nuts and bolts of learning, but that does help. So and you tell me that you've done that. I, I have. And, you, you know, you talk about, um, so the, <clears throat> the, when I went to school and got my 100 ton merchant mariner passport, uh, my credential, mm -hmm. um, it had nothing to do with training. It had everything to do with education. So, you know, I, I came out of that. I, I could have gone in. Well, when I went into it, you had to have, I think it was 300 hours of, of on the water training. So you did have to have experience in order to even register for the class. Um, but mm -hmm. I definitely had not maxed out the tonnage by any means whatsoever. I mean, the majority of the, the hours were on a 22 foot V hole, you know, so mm -hmm. just a little, a Bayliner VR six runabout was my first boat that I got all my yeah. training on driving a boat. Um, and then I went in and got my 100 ton. I mean, that was not a 100 ton boat. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, and so yeah. now I've driven much larger things since then. Um, I, I don't have, you know, anywhere near enough hours to go up to my 200 ton yet, um, let alone up to, you know, an unlimited or anything like that. Nor do I think I ever will. Um, but you know, I, I went into it so that I could commercially uh, launch the charter company and have over six passengers uh, at a commercial capacity yes. and be Coast Guard approved. You know, that was the yes. reason the reasoning that I did it, not to be able to drive the huge boats, <clears throat> which, you know, I do enjoy yeah. that, but that wasn't the purpose of it for me. Um, you know, Gina, something I found interesting when I was reading your book, um, you know, because I'm, I'm a big person and I encourage all of my friends. I, I tell everybody, if your goals and your dreams don't scare you, then they're not big enough. That's something that I have, have gone by and lived by my entire life. My grand, my grandparents taught me that if your, if your dreams aren't big enough, if the, your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. And so, you know, like what I do today, my business and, and the risk that I took getting here and, and the things that I did to be able to do what I do now was a massive mm -hmm. financial risk when I took, when I did this. Um, and I see what you do sailing, what these women have done and a lot of them leaving their lives behind what their previous life was moving in, transitioning into the current life was a massive risk. And chapter 17 is one of the longest chapters in the book. And that chapter is things we fear. And I find it interesting that things that we fear because fear is, I mean, we all have fear, but 17, one of the longest chapters in the book, and it talks about leaving friends and family, leaving behind your worldly treasures, all your tangible items, um, who, who's going to be your contact during an emergency. Um, and then the chapter that followed that was firearms and alcohol. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> how incredibly appropriate that the chapter yeah. that followed fear was firearms and alcohol. <laughs> Yeah, so I yeah, yeah. giggle of that when I was making my notes and I was going back and reviewing <laughs> and I was like how appropriate I mean did you do that on purpose or did you just <laughs> no I think that I think that my ethos is to prepare for the worst but believe in the best yeah so preparation we were talking about preparation and, and learning the basics um of of sailboat handling but it means nothing unless you practice. Right. So, so I would say to your, your ladies, get out there onto any boat you can and be crew and be humble and learn and ask questions and don't be rebuffed. Um, and if you're lucky, you'll find a good mentor. And if you're really lucky, you'll find someone who explains things the way that we women need to have them explained to us. And something that I realized talking about communication as we were, is that we need to have things explained upfront. And what if, what if? Whereas um, a man's way of explaining things uh, can be more last minute and without the preparation. Mm -hmm. So because of that, you have to learn how to ask the right questions. Yep. Mm. Yep. There was um, the, it's, I remember reading one of the things in there. Uh, one of the women was talking about, um, she had a, each time, I think it was how I read it. 
uh, each time she would, her husband would have to do something to fix the boat. She would kind of be over his shoulder, make taking notes. And so eventually she'd had a whole notebook of, of basically uh, mechanical and engineering notes that she was making so that she could go back should something happen to him. Or if she eventually got to the point to where she had memorized these things and she could start fixing things on her own. And I thought that was really impressive. You know, I think that's, I do, I kind of try to, um, uh, shadow my husband a lot of things like I learned how to drive a John Deere tractor here at the campground and track yeah. driving a tractor yeah. is not something I ever thought I would learn how to do and my husband yeah. laughs because it's it's called floating you, you it's called um you, you float the tractor and that's how you level the gravel out here at the campground mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. and that was actually a skill that I learned that um a, our electrician here at the campground saw, saw me and he taught me how to do it and then I ended up teaching my husband how to do it and so when you work with mm -hmm. your spouse and how you teach each other and you feed off each other. And if you, if you treat each other with respect mm -hmm. and you can learn to work in the same environment like that and how you can just learn from each other and it can be enjoyable. Well, I don't think that I could ever, ever learn what Christian has learned since he was a teenager and delivering yeah. boats. Uh, you know, you could probably write a good book. Oh, it's to do. But these days, because there's so much more, um, uh, apparatus on a on a boat you have to know about the the plumbing you have to know the electrics to keep all these various machines and technology going um, and the sophistication improves year by year it's like your, your your laptop if you don't have the latest version you can't download what people send you yeah um, so it you've got to keep up with it and frankly my brain does not work that way. Um, I'm very happy to hand the tools and to stand over and to get this and get that. And I have a maybe a fundamental knowledge of what might need to be done. But to try and find a problem, fix a problem, that's definitely not my forte. But there are women who love that. And I really, really admire them. Um, and it's like my friend Jenny, Australian woman, who her partner was ill, so he couldn't continue their months they had in the Mediterranean on their boat far away. And so she got crew who were technical enough to teach her the basics. And then she had Skype to her partner, um, who was back in, in Australia. How do I do this? What do I do with that? But she could sail the boat you know, well enough. And you and it's quite a testing place with some of the changing melting winds and so on um, around Greece where she was. So, you know, uh, good for her. I think where there's a will, there's a way. way. That's right. And then you transfer those skills to the next part of your life, whether it's going um, in what we call camper vans. I don't what do you call them? You know, uh, around the states and things that I hear of various women now doing. Mm. Yep. Yes. So how much longer do you think you're going to be out on the water? Did you say before you think you're going to be selling and, and, and becoming a. Uh... Uh, well, in, 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 in May, we leave this area and we head down through the Banda Sea, uh, through some of the islands that have got nutmegs and spices and so on. The history is very interesting um, in this area to do with. The, um, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the English, the, the fighting, the, the, the various wars, Japanese, the English, um, and, and how it's all sort of shaken down. And um, so we'll be carrying on through Indonesia, but heading on down south to a large um, chain of islands. Um, Timor-Leste is separate, and then you've got um, West Timor and Flores and various islands, um, uh, Lombok and Bali, and then more islands until you go up the Rial Strait heading towards uh, Singapore and then across the Singapore Strait, which is, you know, pretty dicey. Christian's uh, amazing. Uh, he really is. Um, we sort of go on the very edge of the cargo ship lane so that we're not in anybody's way. Um, and then heading up 
that what they call the Malacca Strait, which used to be full of pirates. I mean, back uh, 50, 80 years ago, um, up past Kuala Lumpur and Penang, which is a lovely city if you ever get the opportunity of going there, um, up towards Langkawi and Thailand. Hopefully we'll have some time to go to Thailand. But you will get there for Christmas. So that's that's the plan. That's, that's <laughs> the adventure. Know, that's the adventure. That's right. No two days are the same. Yeah, no, is, absolutely not. That wonderful. Mm. That's amazing. Was there any, yeah. Anything else you wanted to to discuss? No, where where can or, uh, where can you they can, where can people now? I got your book on um, Amazon. I purchased it on my Amazon Kindle, and so uh, where else can your book be purchased for those who would be interested in it? Certain indie books have it, but um, oh gosh, what's the name of it? <laughs> um, <laughs> Mm. It's entitled Blue Water Women, and it's Gina Devere, and it's D E space V E R E, and then Gina is just G I N A. So that's Gina Devere, and it's Blue Water Women. And I will tell you, I read it in two days. It is a fantastic read. Um, I learned a lot from reading it. I will say that it gave me the confidence that I feel like I needed to tackle sailing this summer. And I'm looking very forward to learning how to sail. Um, it was a lot of fun to read this and then kind of read some about a couple of people that I knew that actually ended up being in the book. Um, <laughs> and so that, that was nice. Um, mm. And uh, so, and I do look forward to your next, uh, your next adventure, your next adventure to reading about it as well. But did right. you find where they well, can find it? What's, what's happening is that as we do various legs, I write articles for magazine in Australia and in New Zealand, but I'm afraid uh, I've written articles um, for American magazines, but it's more relevant to this area of the world, um, the different countries that we go through. Barnes and Noble were the um, other outlet for my book, by the way. Uh, the memory gets a little bit foggy. Uh, so if you want to read any of the articles, I've been very slack since COVID. Um, we were caught in Penang in keeping the website. I don't know what happened. I, we were all ready to, to go off and to, to head off north sailing, uh, south sailing, and COVID came and we were caught. And my inspiration for sailing, for writing, Everything seemed to be on hold for a while, and I've only recently got it back. So um, I'm back writing articles, and I will update my my website at some stage when I get good internet. That's very frustrating. So I have looked online real quick. I have found it at um, shop.harvard.com at the Harvard Bookstore. Um, I have also found it at uh, Barnes & Noble. Uh, Amazon has it, uh, ape books, a P E books.com, uh, good old book.com has it. Yep. Um, yeah, and I, blue, I and it. then your, uh, website, uh, or blog, let's see here, bluewaterwomen.com, which is the one That's she said right. she needs to update. Yeah. So That's there right. are, yeah, there's some, there are, and it was published, uh, in 2018, you guys. Um, mm -hmm. so it is a fabulous book. I highly recommend everyone to read it that has interest in um, women and sailing. Some wonderful stories in it. And Gina, thank you for willing to um, being willing to sit and talk with me for a little while. Uh, this has been it's fantastic. Been an absolute pleasure, Dora. Yes, and you. I've enjoyed hearing about you and your background and, and your business and your boatress. Yeah. And uh, I hope it just goes from strength to strength. I'm sure it will with your power and your innovation um, behind it. You will be successful, be successful, whatever you do. Um, so let's hope that 2024 is a great one for all of us. Yes. Thank you very much, Gina. I greatly appreciate it. You guys, thanks for listening. This is Dora the Boatress with Dockside 365.